Welcome to SVG Europe Women Virtual Directors on Directing Remote Production. I hope you and your families are all well. Today we're looking at the ways directing has changed in the last year, what the challenges of directing off-site actually are, what technologies are being used, what techniques have had to be adapted, and what changes are here to stay and which our directors wish would go back to the old normal sooner rather than later. We have both very experienced directors with us, as well as two up and coming junior directors. So all, they're all ready to share their real world experiences with you and it'll be really interesting. Before I introduce my cast of thousands for our discussion, please remember to post your questions in the Q&A facility. Use the chat facility to talk to each other and comment, but do use the Q&A facility for your questions because I will not be able to scroll through the chat to find them all while I'm trying to talk to our six brilliant directors. So without further ado, please welcome BT Sport Champions League Director Gemma Knight, Sky Sport Senior Director for Football Sarah Cheadle, Freelance Director Kylie Jenner, Freelance Sports TV Director Gudrun Wanek, Premier League Productions Junior Director Grace Wurricone, and last but not least, Professional Squash Association Director and Multi-Skilled Operator Sarah McLaughlin. Hi everybody. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Unmute yourselves, ladies. There we go. Cool. Right. So first of all, I thought we could start by finding out from each of you just briefly how big a change you found directing before the pandemic to what happened after. So what were the major changes each of you experienced or not just to set the scene? Because I know some of you were able to carry on as before. So let's start with Grace. Um so we do about five or six shows a day on Premier League productions. Um, so we went from doing that every, seven days a week to suddenly having to kind of produce one show from home at the very beginning. Um, mm. And you go from being full studio crew and full studio talent to then kind of having to scale that right down to having kind of a skeleton crew and skeleton talent all from home with minimal technology at the very beginning. Um, and there are several challenges that came up with that. So it's just about learning to adapt and kind of work with what you've got. Mm, definitely. And Gemma? Um, so we we didn't shut down, but I, we did about two or three months when there was no football um, before we got the Bundesliga um, at home just prepping. And so I kind of became an office manager and a health and safety manager and sorting out everybody's chairs and desks. And um, so my job completely changed in that interim period. And then um, when we went back, it was fully remote. So from BT have done some remote before, we've done some satellite models um, for the smaller games, but it was, um, right, let's let's go all in. Um, so we did, uh, yeah, every, everything everything remote. We started off with the Bundesliga from home and then we moved back to the studios and played out that plan. But yeah, it's been full remote from there on. Great. And, and Gudrun, what happened to you? Uh, well, here everything came to a full stop within so you're, a you're in of Germany, weeks. aren't you? Yeah, I'm based yeah. in Germany. Uh, so everything was stopped for a couple of months uh then we restarted the bundesliga and uh with a Babel tournament uh the first indoor sports league with basketball uh where a lot changed obviously and then slowly i think beginning in september last year all the other leagues came back to sort of normal with slight changes but everything went back to being produced on site Mm -hmm. Cool. And um, Sarah? M? Sarah M. Sarah's. Yeah, so for us, like a lot of sports, like our tour completely stopped for a while. But then when we went back under like COVID guidelines and we used like a bubble procedure, we were back on site. But again, with the skeleton crew, much like Grace's. So our workflow was the same, but it just was under new procedures. Mm -hmm. Cool. And um, Sarah C? Um, well, for me personally, I'm, I was on maternity leave um, during the pandemic. Um, I started back in September at the start of the season. Uh, so, yeah, it was a huge change for me personally. But, I, I mean, I must praise everyone at Sky for the incredible, um, fantastic work that they put in for the setup. Um, it was an enormous amount of hard work by all the technical team, the sound, the graphics, VT, everyone, um, for the start of the restart in June. And so when I walked back in September... <laughs> All the hard work had been done and I just walked in. Um, so yeah, big up to the Sky team for an incredible setup. 
cool i like that just breeze back in oh you've done it good good (laughs) (laughs) i know all the problems i'm in (laughs) yeah and and kylie what about you uh, much like Sarah, I was off, but not because I was having a baby, but uh, <laughs> there was no work. So for five months, I sat at home and watched everything start up around me, thinking, oh, OK, what's going to happen if I come back? Will I come back? Uh, the uncertainty was quite hard to deal with for those five months. Um, and then like Sarah, once I did come back in August, it was all set up. So um the, like, again, like Sarah, the utmost respect to all the engineers that in all the places that I work, I work in about three or four different places to actually get everything plugged up and new shows coming in every every week for them to go, right, we're going to do that, we're going to do that. And dealing with that and, and learning who, where you can be, where you can't be, where you can walk, what the protocols are in different places. So there was a lot of learning curves just in day to day going into an office yeah definitely cool okay and then i thought we could start with an in-depth look at what grace and sarah mack did as our awesome junior directors um so sarah you directed for the first time during lockdown which is kind of an achievement to do that. <laughs> but you were actually traveling the globe to site whereas grace uh, you started directing a couple of years ago but we were given the opportunity to really get your teeth into remote directing last year so two very different experiences so can you both tell us about how your careers as junior directors have actually progressed during lockdown um, maybe start with sarah yeah so before lockdown i had done sort of like some games in smaller events um what was doing like the replay and four broadcast days was like a real like desire to want to get to direct mm-hmm. so when we came back and we'd done a few events uh, i got an opportunity to direct the men's platinum qatar classic which was obviously such a huge jump for me and something that i wanted to do for a long time and then from that i got to do uh, early rounds and quarterfinals of the women's blackball and the men's and this is all squash for those of you that don't know um so for me it was like a very huge jump and a huge progression very quickly, um, which was something I was very grateful for because I knew that that wasn't something that a lot of people had got an opportunity to do over lockdown. So yeah, yeah. crazy trajectory for me. <laughs> cool. And what was difficult about what you had to do? I mean, it, the fact that everyone was in lockdown, there were lots of restrictions, you have to get on planes with masks, and everyone's got germs around you. Uh, you know, what was, what, was the, what was the hard bit for you, the hardest? couple of things that you had to go through to do that I think the idea of it first of all was difficult because you'd spent so much time at home and you had your own little bubble and you were following all the guidelines but the our um, operations did a really good job of kind of making everyone feel comfortable because we had to test before we left there were very specific procedures about how we got to the airport what we did like wearing our masks and then when we arrived we would get tested at the airport you would wait until you got that that you were negative and then every four days after that you were getting tested so like we knew that we were as safe as you possibly could be especially with like you had to be distanced from people we had no to minimal audience which is something that's quite rare for us um, and a skeleton crew so as scary as it was you actually did feel quite comfortable because everything that could be done was being done yeah cool and then as uh, you know your first directing experience in that circumstance in a different country how did that feel you know what was that like to be honest I was just really excited it was like something I had wanted to do for such a long time that I didn't care what how it was going to happen I was just going to make it happen where I was um and the crew that I had with me were really supportive and they were there to get it done too so yeah I didn't really care that it was like a pandemic I was just excited to do it (laughs) and then Grace great so you've been directing a couple of years and uh during lockdown you got to direct a program remotely so tell us about what happened um so yeah I'd basically been learning the craft and building my experience before lockdown um and kind of similar to Gemma once we went into lockdown it was kind of at the very beginning we didn't really know what was going to happen and how long we were going to be in lockdown whether we were still going to be employed all the rest of it so you kind of at a loss and then slowly slowly we had to start bringing back programs one by one trying to figure out what we could do from home and we used this software with this company called Cloudcast um which enabled you to have lots of different inputs um with contributors so you'd have people essentially kind of zooming in 
um, and you'd have them as your kind of camera input and you've got talk back to them. So the producer could talk to them, the director can talk to them. Um, and you also had the ability to fly in some graphics and, and floats and underlays and VT and stuff. So it was learning. We had to spend a couple of days learning how that software worked, um, testing it out with each other. What are the capabilities? And then we basically had such a skeleton crew. We had a director, a producer and an AP. Um, and between the three of us, um, so the two of us junior directors, me and my colleague Paul, and we basically built built all the ULAs. We got sent all the footage, had to learn Premiere and Adobe kind of Photoshop and all the rest of it, build the graphics ourselves, upload it onto this system. Um, and then once you've got the contributors there, you kind of, we were PAing at the same time and that blows my mind. I, I'm very bad at maths and I cannot count backwards. Um, and so I had my stopwatch. I had like time calculator on the internet set up. So I was, so I was timing the, like the parts as we were going. And then I'd be like figuring out how much time we had left to stopping talking at the same time, flying in these ULAs and cutting the cameras. And so we were vision mixing almost at the same time in like the most basic sense. Um, but then at the same time, I had like my iPhone up with the kind of countdown of how long we had left to stopping talking and I'm telling the talent and the producers we've got 10, 10 seconds to stopping talking nine eight whatever so it was a lot to learn in a very short space of time but it was brilliant and and like Sarah was saying earlier you just had so much to learn and I love challenges so I kind of found it really exciting and, and different and it was just something to get your teeth into I learned a lot of new skills that I wouldn't have otherwise in terms of the editing and and all the rest of it and I've directed more than I would have ever directed before lockdown just the way that the fixtures have then been since then um it's just been there's just there's been so much football so I would never have directed as much as I have going back into the studio and and that was the thing as well once football started to come back and we had project restart we then had to look at how we go back into the studio and that was the fourth, first point we went back in um, and stopped doing things remotely so we had to look at the studio and work within the covid guidelines in terms of distancing and how many people you could have in one room and adapt to that and we kind of rechanged all of our set along with the with the studio crew mm. and our senior director so mm. learning to adapt mm. all of that and then going back into working in the office that that was a challenge as well but it's it's all been learning um, and I, I take a lot of positives from it cool and then do you think that having you know your previous experience pre-covid and then that crash course in directing <laughs> during lockdown do you do you think like plp has actually taken on board the fact that you you've now I mean that that must have leapfrogged your experience forward maybe an extra year or something so you know three months in lockdown counts as like three years in the real world so, so is that actually really going to boost do you think they they will realize that your your directing skills are that much further advanced than they were I hope so because <laughs> I feel like I can watch this and then because <laughs> I feel like I've come on far but I also yeah. feel like just everything aside from COVID, just the amount of time in the chair has increased so much than, than it would have done if COVID hadn't happened. So I think personally for me, I've just grown in experience and the number of different situations I've had to deal with in terms of, we now have so many contributors, even now in the studio from Zoom or on Skype, which we never used to have so much before. And obviously that brings its own challenges in terms of connectivity and people's internet and all the rest of it. And, and dealing with things like that when they go down and it, it's not all going to plan, um, it just adds to my experience. So I know that I feel a lot more confident when I'm in the chair as well. So hopefully that shows then when I'm directing and the way that I talk and kind of um, use talk back and, and the manner in which I direct, hopefully that kind of confidence now comes across because I think I've built on that experience. Definitely. Cool. Okay. Race for promotion. <laughs> let's, move on to, let's move on to Sarah C. Um, so Sarah, of the 53, you've directed quite a lot of matches since <laughs> from maternity leave. It's like, right, she's had some time off. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So of the 53 matches you've directed in September, 46 have been directed remotely from Sky Osterley, and you've only been on seven OB. So can you tell us about that experience now. How did that feel? What kind of a you know, crash course have you had in, in the return to work? Uh, I'm not sure I can compete with Grace. That sounds <laughs> Um, yeah, so I suppose for me, um, I the amount of years I've been directing, I'm so used to the sort of um, OB and the sort of life, the OB lifestyle, if you like. So on a typical day, match day, I would be leaving early, 
getting to the OB early, looking around, uh, fax check, meal break. Um, you know, you'd, you'd be on site a long time. Um, and that was just part of the experience. Um, so then suddenly when I went for my first re remote game in September, obviously they've, they've shortened the call times on site now because of the COVID sort of restrictions were on less than the amount of people on site for le less periods of time. Um, so I remember when I, I my first OB in September, I, I sort of got into Sky ridiculously early. People were looking at me like, what on earth are you doing here? But I'm, I was so used to being there so hours and hours beforehand. So I, I didn't really know what to do with myself, if I'm honest. I sort of got in, like, that. Here, here's your position, right, great, what do I do now? So, um, so yeah, in that respect, it's, ve it's, very, it's very different. Um, uh, but I think once, once I settled into it, I mean, we've, they've, they've created some uh, fantastic uh, specific galleries at Sky that just replicate the OB truck. So once you're actually sitting and, and you're doing the match, it, it doesn't feel... Everything around it is very different, obviously, but once you're actually physically directing the match, it's like it was, so. Yeah, so it must be like being on a film set of being in an OB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, personally, I, I do miss the OBs. There's lots of things you can miss about. I, I miss seeing the OB people, the personnel, the relationships. I miss seeing like the camera people, you know, you'd have a uh, chat around the tea urn, um, chat about things, what people have been up to, et cetera. Now I'm working with people, some people I've never even met. Um, I, I don't know them, um, they're, but they're all doing a fantastic job, obviously. But it's, yeah, you, I, I definitely miss the personal side of talking to commentators on site, floor managers, um, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I miss the dinner bus. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all like those. Um, and just as a, the, the OB experience, really, I, you know, like I'm, I'm off to Spurs in a bit, I'm doing the cup final on Sunday. Um, when you're not on site, you sort of miss that whole, I, I know we sit in a car park in the truck, but you actually to be able to go into the ground beforehand, get a feel, look at the banners. I don't know, just, just you just get an OB feel, don't you? Like, a, like an experience. And also yeah. things like, um, silly things like camera positions or little tweaks. If you're not there walking the route, like hub team arrivals, for example, if you don't walk the route, um, if you don't see those little those little potential issues, you, you're relying very much on the on the people, the OB team to help you sort things. But I, I kind of miss going out to sort of physically see it for myself. Yeah, yeah, that's what I miss. I feel. Sarah, are you are you at Wembley on Sunday, or is that yes. remote as well? The final. You're at Wembley. No, I'm, yeah, yeah. A little treat. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, very much so. <laughs> very much so. Yeah, be a treat. So we're going to talk more about that <coughs> later on. Sarah. I don't want to go too early yet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to Gemma. Um, so you've also been wildly busy. Um, I know a lot of your work has been carried out at home remotely through EMG's UK Rock at High Wycombe with Telegenic. Um, so tell us how your setup and workflow is designed, you know, when it started. Because I remember talking to you early on in lockdown and you didn't have enough internet at home <laughs> or something to actually start back straight away with the others. Um, so how's your workflow designed? You know, what's it been like to work across so many Premier League, Champions League, FA Cup and Women's Super League matches over the last few months? Um, it's been different. Um, this this year has been very different. Like, as you said, my... Um, internet when I when we first went remote um we were doing all of our presentation from home so for the Premier League um and the last day of the season all of that there were certain crews from home so I directed from home there was a vision mixer with a vision mixing kit at his house sound with a sound desk in their garage um we were really fully remote and that was uh quite scary and quite difficult for, yeah so for me my internet was horrendous um, I couldn't work until it was fixed so um, that that was a big problem I just didn't have anywhere near the connectivity that I needed also I live really rurally and we often have power cuts um, a lot like at least one or two a month um, so that was also very scary that at some point it could all just disappear um, so we had to have fail safes like vision mixers who were comfortable to just take over and carry on um, and all of them were extremely uh, yeah, experienced and uh, did a fantastic job when there were technical issues. Um, and eventually we kind of moved back into, into Stratford and, and The Rock. So our setup with uh, Telegenic at The Rock is um, 
is exactly as Sarah said. So it's almost like the technology remotes into a truck. So we still send a truck on site with a really stripped back crew. Um, and then you are seeing a mirror of the uh, monitor stack at the OB and your desk is a remote of the desk at the OB. Um, all of the EVS is all of the hardware is all on site. So we're just kind of remoting into that technology. I, I think Sky maybe do it slightly different where they bring all the feeds into the building. So it, it, there's different models of how it works, but that's the way we are currently working, um, which seems to be okay. Um, it's It's been pretty, uh, I don't want to jinx it and say bulletproof so far. Yeah. We've not had any major issues, certainly none on air, which have been fantastic. Um, but we, we are led by, BT is led by um, a annoyingly forward thinking engineering team. Um, they are fantastic, but they're always pushing us to do new stuff. If there's something that comes out, it's like, oh, we're going to do this tomorrow. And you're like, oh, OK. Um, so they have been, we're lucky that we've been dipping our toe in quite a lot before COVID hit, before before lockdown. So we'd done two or three years of very small eight camera remote OBs that had been going fairly well. Um, and that was cutting, cutting match and prez. Um, so we, we kind of knew we could do it. it, we just hadn't done it at quite the scale that we were expecting to do. So we've now done all of the Premier League fully remote um, and the Champions League. And as I say, it seems to have gone pretty well. It does, it does indeed. Uh, now let's go to Kylie. So Kylie, I, I wasn't going to make, I know you're making cakes, we have to talk about cake, but you had a five month hiatus. <laughs> Um, before you got back to directing in August um, with MotoGP for North One and BT Sports. Um, how was it going from quite a long break, making cakes, uh, back to working in very, very different conditions? Uh, it was the fear of going back. Um, which you don't, I didn't know how much it moved on and how far out I was, because much you can talk to people about what's going on you sit there you don't really know how it how it works and, and the idea of like Sarah said about not seeing people that that you know that you can go and ask that often you just sort of have these conversations away and how does it work how does that work and you just sat in that seat with a few people around you and then everybody else is on the end of a microphone you don't know that anybody else is there you just know that they're there um, and then sometimes the technology does fail but um, we sometimes a graphics operator wouldn't be able to hear you or the PA wouldn't be able to talk back to you so accounts would all be gone all those fears um, were there and some and some of them came out I mean um, the hardest thing I think I did was uh, the launch for the Ineos uh, new cycle team which mm -hmm. was out in the south of France sadly I was in Ineos in the south of France <laughs> I had no idea of the setup so I was relying on a floor manager down there to say, right, this is the stage, this is what we're allowed to do, which of course kept changing because it was in France. They were in the middle of the COVID crisis as well. So they had different rules each day. So what we thought we could do, we couldn't do. So having someone else's um, eyes and ears down there was quite hard. As a, as a director, that's your job. You are kind of in control of things and have to let that control hope that it will work and somehow it, it does you know those engineers have put so much into place to make it work cool yeah yeah it sounds it sounds a bit hairy and also you mentioned like it's the fear of going back to work kind of anxiety of going back into you know the, the mass of human humanity sort of thing yeah. when when you've been safely tucked up at home you know yeah 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 it is it's just um yeah, all those relationships and and, and safety as well because we don't know what other people are thinking. Like, oh, I found that. Um, you had some people who were like super strict and were wearing masks all the time and they were really, really uh, careful not being anywhere near us. And then other people who kind of didn't believe in it, you know, so were in your face wearing masks. And so the protocols were different everywhere else. Well, so, but you'd want to learn one place and then you'd have to go somewhere else. Right, so have to do that. Sit with marketing on the gallery, that place, I don't know. So there was all so much to learn. 
from having to go to so many yeah com complicated far too complicated but yeah yeah necessary though still got sport on telly so that worked <laughs> okay now let's go to Gudrun hello um okay. so you you have been had to work as part of a covid bubble which is really interesting because we heard a lot about covid bubbles um covid bubble sounds like it's the wrong thing <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so you, you were part of a covid bubble for the return of the german basketball Bundesliga which was the restart you say of the first indoor sports league in Europe and the US because you beat their basketball as far as I know yeah, I th yeah. I'm pretty, pretty certain that it was the first in western countries cool. <laughs> I don't know cool. about Asia but yeah so, so what happened and what was the experience of being in a bubble like that that whole thing uh well the the basketball Bundesliga was basically the I mean all other leagues just cancelled their their seasons or many other leagues cancelled their seasons uh, and the basketball Bundesliga just got in touch with like experts health experts uh, virus experts and they created basically a bubble tournament which meant that the top ten ranked teams of the Bundesliga were all put together in a hotel with referees, uh, with, you know, all their staff. Um, they were playing at one venue here in Munich. Um, and they were basically isolated from the outside world. Um, um, and there was part of our crew within that uh, bubble. So mm -hmm. we had a reporter there, a camera. We had, you know, a, a, a studio set up there in the hotel. And part of our crew was traveling with the teams to the venue and back. Um, and for us, it was a production on site, but it was also like remote because obviously uh, everybody from the OB man could not enter the arena because everything was zoned really strictly. So uh, we were outside zone three, the, the players and staff uh, were zone one and everybody in the arena, camera operators, reporters, commentators were zone two. And we just could not mingle at all. And that was really strange because, you know, you're at your, you know, home, home arena and you can't get, go in there. Um, mm. You can't, you know, even camera positions, which you used to have like really close to the court, they have to either set up, be set up remotely so that they're operated from, from the track or from further away in the arena or mm -hmm. they have to change completely so we had as like the other said some like really stripped down personal personnel we had less positions than we used to have uh, many of them were remote or chip uh, cameras so and it was just very very strict just trying to make sure you don't get in touch with anybody which is also really hard because that's what, what Sarah C said I mean you you used to chatting with colleagues hanging out having a beer afterwards or whatever or just going inside having a look at positions and you couldn't do that so you had always communication was a big issue because you just needed so much more radio communication also Skype calls or yeah. integration of 5G cameras from um from the hotel for example so it was it was quite quite a challenge to get it to you know setting that whole thing up and then tr also trusting it to work um because you know skype calls just usually crash once you're on air <laughs> they do. um and that kind of stuff and also just like being used or getting used to to uh having just to talk much much more than you used to because you just have to like communicate in, you know, in an entirely different way but um it just worked really well it took everybody i mean the tournament went on for like almost i think three weeks or something like that and it just took everybody a couple of days to get adjusted to it and then it just it just became another routine and mm. basically that that bubble concept or that zoning concept then was just similar to what has been used in football in hockey or whatever uh, so i think that zoning co concept is, is what we're all used to and except for one sports league here the handball league uh, which has been produced remotely forever or for the for the past years um everything went back to being on site but with just different different setups uh 
and skeleton crews, of course, less cameras in some cases, cameras further away from the pitch or the, the field of play. So that's that's basically what, what changed. Cool. So with, with your colleagues that were in the bubble, were you you weren't allowed to talk to them face to face, even or shout at them from a distance? You, you no, know. you would. I, I never saw them actually. Wow. I never okay. saw them. I just saw them on camera, or I never met them during those those three weeks. Yeah, and then just after more, the final. Right. So th from a directing point of view, you say it just it just worked, but I mean, were there any other challenges, or was it mostly about the the you know talk back and that sort of thing? Um, well. Obviously, if you're if you're not as close to the field of play as you're used to, you still want, but you still want to be able to transport the same images or emotions. And the further away you are, as we all know, the harder it is to you know be really close up. And you have, of course, no crowd in the arena, so it's a very quiet thing if if the if there's nobody there and you still try to you know be kind of close up to the game so that was something where where we just worked a lot on framing on basically what thinking about well what's going to replace the crowd shots what's going to what which emotions can you use what's there and uh, and fortunately in basketball i mean the the benches they are just loud and it's a closed arena so you have more noise than you would have in a in a football field just because it's a it's a building so mm -hmm. that's definitely an advantage we had there but but it first felt just really um neutral and then mm -hmm. to make that feel alive that was i think one of the bigger challenges but that's also something which grows organically once the, once you advance in the in the tournament because obviously everybody's getting used to it and it's getting more intense because it's getting you know it's it's sort of like playoffs the further you're in um the more intense it gets definitely definitely so talking about Come, you know, sports coming back and stuff. We'll go back to Kylie now to talk about BT Sports Score. So, um, you had to restart BT Sports Score at BT Studios in Stratford. Uh, when did that happen? What was the process? What were the challenges you faced? And how did that production change to suit today's working practices? The first issue we had was whether it was going to happen or not. And mm. we got the go ahead about 10 days before we went on air. Um, because we didn't know what the Premier League was going to do with the games. Um, obviously, we are very reliant on games happening at three o'clock because that's when we're on air. And we have to have something to talk about. So when they started spreading the games and there was one game left at three o'clock on the Premier League, it was a bit like, OK, that's quite a lot for people to talk about. <laughs> Not a lot for people to talk about. Um, we were lucky in that uh, Sky then allowed us to... Uh, talk about some championship games and Premier League games, uh, Scottish games, we had them coming in and we then uh, had European games that had started as well. So that was that bit sorted, but we had 10 days then to sort everything else out. We had to reduce the amount of people on set. Um, pundit wise, we had to go down from five to four uh, mm. and then pass out to presenters. Luckily, Studio One is a huge studio, so we had plenty of space to do that. Um, Crew wise, we had to reduce dramatically because BT had a um, number of people in the building policy. So it wasn't just us being in there. It was the Premier League were also around. Uh, the MotoGP were also in. Various people doing Bundesliga that were going straight to matches. So we had to fit in with everybody else as well. Mm -hmm. So our gallery went down from, well, we, had, we, used to, we used to run off two galleries plus uh, two offshoot galleries for AR and things. So we had to reduce down to one gallery. So from a cast of about 56 staff, we were down to about 12 on site, okay. uh, which was quite <laughs> challenging. So I think we had, I think in one of our galleries, we would have had about 13 or 14 people. That's now, and we're still working at six in that gallery. Uh, we had to go from, uh, two jibs and a steady cam down to one jib uh, and three cameras. Mm. And two of those are now remotely operated. Um, the AR that we used that we relied on quite heavily had to go because that little gallery that they worked in, four were in there and they couldn't fit 
they could only have one person in there legally to fit with the COVID. So that was gone. Um, so we had to yes, just look at how we could do it, where we could put people in galleries. So at one point it was suggested that the producer would go and sit in the green room and produce from there, at which point I went, mm, no, I don't think that's going to work ever. Um, because producers are renowned for sometimes listening to lots of other things and not the director and you're not knowing what you're supposed to be doing. So, um, and so we love the producers writing, no, we don't, no, we don't. <laughs> yeah, he'll say that, but he knows it. Uh, and and it's eye contact as well. It, that's what I found most strange is that you don't realise how much eye contact or how much stuff you say without speaking. Mm. And I think one, uh, someone else said about not finding that you're speaking so much more than you would normally and that's because you can't just look at someone and, and you know put thumbs up or just raise an eyebrow just say that's not going to happen um so we had to deal with all, with all of that um and yeah just reducing down what we could do what we were talking about and we did it the PA is still off-site because um we we figured that with score it's not so time sensitive we don't have lots of vts that we have to hear and, and things like that so if they went down i as an xpa i could take over which and it did happen we suddenly we were in a break uh one week and suddenly we couldn't hear the pa counting out of the break and luckily i sort of realized that we couldn't hear and with about it was seven seconds i think coming out of the break we suddenly got transmission back to me and we were able to plan out the break and, and nobody knew that that was quite hairy at that point. I think, yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so we kind of had to work out who could stay at home, who didn't need to be in the office. So you know, the, the stats guy, he's at home. He's worked at home, mm. uh, and and it, and it all works. It's just all the compromises that we've had to make. And there's there's been a few fights, not physical fights, obviously, but and just silly things like being able to get a cup of tea. But if you're on, you're in a gallery for five hours, and I know Grace will certainly know all of that. They're the important things, Kylie. Very important thing. <laughs> but it's just you know you need a refreshment, you need a glass of water, and you've got no one that can go and get it for you. So you have to try and be, you've got to work out how that can happen, and how and can you go all day without having a cup of tea? Yeah, you know, Kylie, how? How have you found your team being so broken up? Because I think the hardest thing for me in our remote setup is we, like, as I said before, our engineers are amazing and they've made it technically work and I have no idea how, but Kylie would appreciate, we've got lots of small rooms. So everybody is in the building, but you can't see any of them. Um, yeah. And so your talk back, the, the, the amount of traffic that now goes through your talk back rather than that you overhear in the room is huge to the point you do this a lot. Yeah. Um, it, it's a bit frantic um how have you found that yeah you're absolutely right you just hear so much more that you wouldn't normally hear that conversations that are going on because some people forgot that they're they're on talkback and everybody has to be able to hear everyone um but yeah it is it's really hard that that team element is, is quite difficult mm. as well keeping that together and we we were during the first lockdown we had a score quiz that went on so we kept that relationship going through I think it lasted about three months uh, my team won just to <laughs> <laughs> um yeah trying to keep that element as well that because we we sort of pride ourselves on being a, a kind of score family hmm. and trying to make sure everyone was included and as a director being the go-between between, between the staff or the the crew and um BT was that was quite a hard balancing act as well because a lot of our crew are freelancers so they often felt that they were left out because yeah. staff were getting communi communications about what was happening the freelancers wouldn't get anything so I would have to then go back to BT and try and explain to them and that that was quite a precarious position to be in I think sometimes because that was a bit how far how much can I say as a freelancer but luckily, BT did listen, and they they you know we got through it, and you know we're nearly nearly at the end now. Yes, <laughs> get those vaccinations, people. Yes. <laughs> <on Monday. laughs> Great. Okay, that's that's really yeah. All of you have been through so much stuff. Don't forget to post questions for our directors because we've got a few questions left, and then we're going to go on to audience Q and A. So start posting, please. Right. So 
this one's for all of you. Oh, no, it's not. No, no, Sarah C, we haven't spoken about your matches tonight and on Sunday. So you're directing mm. your fourth match at Spurs at six o'clock <laughs> at Spurs. <laughs> be careful Heather be very careful yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the league cup final this Sunday so can you tell us how are you going to be working on these um you know remote or you already said you're going to be on site so how's that going to work and why are you going to be on site why why aren't you doing it remotely yeah well spurs I mean goodness what a few days it's been all around it's it's yeah yeah anyway um so yeah they are both um <clears throat> actually on site for me personally i'm going on site um so tonight for example uh so there's lots of there's lots of factors that sort of come into play on the decisions of what is fully remote what is a traditional ob etc um i think currently at sky we can do two matches a day fully remote so tonight for example at sky we've got uh villa man city and also an EFL game, uh, Rotherham Middlesbrough, which is a huge game, especially for us Derby fans. Let's not talk about Derby. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the decision was made that will that Spurs will be um, a, a, an OB as such. Uh, I can mm. say it's lots, of, it's lots of factors that deal with gallery space um, and truck logistics as much as anything really so uh, yeah so Spurs tonight will be an OB um, and then on Sunday um, again we have a huge Super Sunday game Leeds Man United so that'll be done um, from Sky with the Prez at Sky as well um, and then the other remote gallery will be used for um, the presentation because on a cup final obviously it's a huge presentation um and it was deemed easier for the match to go on site and the other gallery to be kept for the presentation so that's the reason for that cool excellent and are you are you ready liked up had a good sleep <laughs> no. <laughs> no i mean it was all kicking off last night wasn't it it was brilliant so um, yeah i mean looking forward to ryan mason being in charge of spurs see what he can do um yeah it's yeah, like I said before, I'm excited to be able to go out and about. Um, but it, but I mean, like, so, so for example, so I, I'm on site, but of course, it's still a sort of remote production in terms of, like on Sunday, for example. So my replays are being done from Manchester. Um, the presentation's on site, but all that's obviously remotely produced and directed back at Sky. The graphics are all back at Sky. So I think, as, as the previous was saying, the team is split across the country in this case, Manchester everywhere. Um, but we're still all working on the same thing. But yes, it, it, I think as Kylie was saying, it, it's very different, sort of not, not all being together. And, and even the eye contact is interesting because uh, in the gallery of the sky, in the sort of smaller ones, for example, because of the COVID restrictions currently, we have a vision mixer who helps with the replays, but they sit behind you, which is, you know, never happened before. Your vision mixer is always sat to your right. You can chat, you can, again, the eye contact, you, sometimes before you said anything, they might do something but not being able to see them. And yeah, it's all very, very bizarre. Very, very bizarre. And that, that my next question was going to be, what do you all find to be the biggest challenge of directing remotely um, for all of you? So either from first-hand experience or what you've heard other people say about their experiences. So for Sarah, C, what was, so your, your biggest loathing? What one, what's <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah. I think, I think as, as I said before, just, just sort of being on an OB and seeing the, the people, the, getting the feel of the ground. Um, yeah, just, just so different in that respect. I, I'm so, like I said, I'm so used to doing that whole drive up to an OB, seeing everyone, the whole sort of day to day, um, sorry, hour to hour being on the OB and then not having that. And again, I, I literally, I didn't have the experience of lockdown. I was busy homeschooling and trying to bring up a, a baby. That's another story. Um, so it's literally, I left the OB world, I've done a normal OB, see you in nine months or whatever, and then come back and it's like completely, it's for everybody, obviously, but you know what it's like with a pandemic. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do really miss that sort of side of it when we're, when we're remote. It's just very different. It's, and it's also the levels of complexity. So again, on an OB, something might happen with a camera, for example, and you go, right, um, poke your head around the door vision can you sort that now it's like right is it a problem with the camera is it a problem with the feed is it a problem with OCR 
what is the issue and, and it, it, you get you go to the your sound man who then speaks to the sound man on site about something and it's just a, a lot more long-winded and the levels of complexity are a lot you get there in the end but yeah it, it's just it's sort of a slower process I suppose if you like um I say it's just it's just the levels of the complexity of it all I mean it's incredible but yeah it does yeah. Really, yeah harder much harder what about Gudrun well, as I said, I mean, we've been on site, um, but I think um, everybody's longing to get back to be closer to the pitch, basically. I think that's the biggest, uh, like, you wouldn't have any steady cams on the pitch, you wouldn't have any courtside cameras, and whether it's remote or not, I think that's what everybody's missing. I mean, there have been experiments in the Bundesliga here with, you know, uh, automated rail cameras and stuff that are really close to the pitch, but you don't have anything on the pitch, for example. And I mean, um, I think here it's still, I mean, remote production in the Bundesliga has been tested, but it, it's not going to be anywhere near happening in the upcoming seasons i believe mm -hmm. um i think it, we're, we're still working pretty old school here and to be honest i'm happy about it i really like what sarah said i just love being on in the stadium in the arena um being able to you know watch the warm-up standing near the pitch or or near the, near the field of play chatting with people so i mean every it's i think it's pretty similar like like to you guys there everybody's longing to get vaccinated and then go back to be on site be close to people chat hang out um, travel together because that's that's one of them i mean we're still traveling a lot to to games but we're all traveling alone and that's for example something we just love we we just love traveling together chatting um stuff like that um so that's 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 basically what's going on here. Everybody's mm -hmm. longing to go back to on-site production and fearing actually everything going to remote because obviously it has been proven to work and it saves money, obviously. But still here, we're like, we want to stay in the stadium. We want to stay. <laughs> let us out, let us out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Gemma, what about you? I, I think... Everything that everybody else says is obviously exactly where I'm at. I think um, our, our biggest challenge is with, with our different styles of remote. So when we first started, we, do it by, we did it by a, a satellite delivery where there was a huge delay. Um, and cutting a football match where when you cut a camera, um, you're seeing pictures that happened two to three seconds ago is really hard. <laughs> so you want to react. The point of being a match director is it's on you to to find the shot and to, to cut the reaction or to, to kind of just you want to follow the game and keep it as pacey as possible and I would sit there going okay stand by camera two cut and it was just like painful um and but that's gone away because we've got different like different technologies now and that's that's gone away for a lot of our production which is is great but the, yeah the big the big thing for me is generally communication is is asking the question and as Chief said you'd look for a window or you pop into vision and no one responds and the silence is deafening you sit there going Gemma vision Gemma to vision nothing anyone there and you can't you can't raise them apart from kind of relying on talkback which is is really really hard um but that's the technical side and and the the actual editorial around the match as well is 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 um is really hard because you know for example on Sunday when all the stuff about the ESL broke um you've got a group of pundits on site who want to chat to the producer and they want to go do you know what what what, what do we say here we, we think this you know how, how do how do we portray that on the screen and and that level of, of communication and and chat team chat is 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 currently not quite where it could or should be um but hopefully that will improve Definitely. And Kylie? Um, for me, being in the galleries and uh, positions have just slightly changed. So quite often you're not in front of the uh, program on things slightly offset. Yeah. And then the more, um, barriers up between everybody. So the sound is all slightly distorted. So even 
something's wrong and it's not wrong, but you're not quite sure because you don't, everything's echoey. And then certainly at PLP, in certain galleries, you've got so little space that you can just about get your chair in and out. It's just silly little logistics that you're like, oh my God, this could just, and you can't, you can't change it, but it's, they're the things you just want to go back to a little bit more space, be able to see what you're supposed to hear, see and hear what you're supposed to hear. They're the things that I think I find most challenging. Cool. And Sarah M, so you haven't actually worked remotely. What do you, what, what's your thoughts on it? Well, I think like from listening to women, the thing that I would probably find quite difficult and seems to be an issue too is the communication side of it. Like the idea that Gemma's talking about of having like a three second delay sounds terrifying. It's like, how do you go about doing that right? Um, and not being able to like talk to people and work like as a team um I think I would find quite difficult because that personal like aspect of it I think is what creates such a good show is being able to like, talk with people see what they're really feeling through what their body language or something is saying or like not just what they're actually saying so I think that, that would be quite difficult mm, definitely and Grace what about you um, everything everyone has said is, is totally on board with us. I totally agree. Um, the thing for us is we have to wear masks all the time now when, we, when we're directing. So we're in the gallery for 10 hours a day. And like Kylie was saying, you can't, you don't necessarily get enough time to kind of go and get a drink or get a cup of tea or whatever. But you're, you're wearing these masks, which is so, so uncomfortable. And going back to that eye contact point, like you just sometimes look across to graphics or you'd look across to VT beforehand and be able to mouth something or, or kind of give them a nod. And now you can barely understand what people are saying, even on talkback, because they're wearing masks. So that's another challenge that we've had to kind of adapt to. So I can't wait to lose the masks because that would make like <laughs> a million times easier. Um, but it also goes back to what I was saying in terms of it's such a delicate balance when we first came back with um, PLP is the same that a large proportion of our workforce is freelance. Um, so obviously people had to come, they, they'd had a hiatus and they had to come back because people need to work to live. Um, but there's such a high level of anxiety as well in terms of where COVID was at the time and the second wave was coming in. Uh, in terms of distancing so people were in but they didn't necessarily want to be in or felt comfortable being in but you have to because you everyone needs to work so it was kind of managing that and managing the communication um, in terms of what our protocols were and the things we we're putting in place to keep everybody safe and we have barriers in between every single position we reduce numbers within the gallery and the studio um, we had to move departments out of the gallery so graphics went out the gallery VT went out the gallery and then then that takes us into kind of the point everyone was saying about communication because it just meant that there was so much more traffic going in through your ear you had to be so much more concise with what you were communicating and it is exactly that where you kind of go grace to VT silence grace to VT whereas normally you just look behind and go oh they're building it it's fine it'll be there that's the it's the worst noise ever is the yeah. is the silence <laughs> Just, just tell me I'm working on it or just tell me <laughs> yeah, yeah. Check. whatever it is. Am I? Anything. Yeah. <laughs> well that I, I get that it's fine leaving us from the OB. <laughs> That's one of my least favorite. <laughs> like, silent <laughs> or it's fine leaving us. You're like, well, so where's the problem? Sorry, Grace. <laughs> no, it's exactly that. So it's kind of learning to adapt, but it's also kind of a way of working. Like communication is key in a kind of any walk of life. So it's just it, developing that skill and adapting it to kind of the current situation that we're in. Um, and the masks, I think, is the key key thing for us because you can't even smile at someone. You can't. You don't know what. So even somebody next to you, my vision mix is sitting next to me, and I can't. I have to kind of like lean back to understand what they're saying because I've got the screen in the way. They've got a mask in front of their face, and yeah. without taking up even more airspace and keying through to me, I just can't hear them in the gallery, kind of thing. Mm. There's a lot of conversations between director and vision mixer that no one else needs to hear. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And, and and it's like, uh, and so you're having those conversations over talkback, and it's just annoying. It annoys me because yeah, uh, yeah, it, it that is hard. Agreed. Okay, so okay. last last big question for okay. you: In a post-COVID world, well, whether you like it or not, what do you think will stick from remote directing? You know, what aspects of it, or will we? Will remote directing be a major thing now you know what do you think is going to actually stay around whether you want it to or not Goodwin 
Well, I mean, I, I believe, if, especially here where it's not that common, it's going to be moving towards it a lot, just for um, financial reasons, obviously. Um, and also because technology and networks are just going to be so much more powerful or are already so much more powerful and are not that hard to implement anymore so i think that's uh i think germany is probably taking note of what's happening in the uk or in france or wherever or in the us especially um and i think we'll be moving i mean the company i work for a lot they are thinking about moving one league towards um towards um remote and i think that that's going to be the move we'll be seeing here a lot cool who would like to go next i think it's all staying i think this is it um uh, and i don't want to say whether you like it or not because i want to be um very positive about it because i do think as everyone said that you know you thank the engineers and all the people that have technically come up with it because it's astounding when you sit there and you look at what's going on and how it's working it blows my mind it's fantastic um and with all those challenges yeah even on top of that it is amazing but i i think for for us certainly at bt this this is where we're at and they're only looking at developing the technology and and making it uh, even more robust and looking at new ways to make the remote workflows better um, so it, it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Sarah C? Um, yeah, like Gemma says, it's here to stay. But I think we do have to look at the positives as well. We think about the environment, for example. Um, it's less travelling for a lot of people um, to have to open. So in, in that respect, that, that's a really good thing. Um, less traveling, more time at home, arguably, um, better sort of work-life balance. You're not rushing up and down all, everywhere all the time. So, and it is fantastic as well. Like the cake, like uh, everyone said, it's incredible that we can do what we can do remotely. Um, and people at home probably don't notice the difference. And that's the main thing, the customers at the end of the day, isn't it? So they want to see football and we were privileged and that we were allowed to uh, deliver it during a pandemic and keep people going so in that respect we embrace it and um yeah carry on cool and Kylie. On the back. Oh. yeah i think okay. uh, as the others have said it's um it's it is here to stay i think you know we people companies were doing it two years before this has happened so uh you can see that that's the way they were heading um, and actually, it has worked. You know, yes, there are things yeah. that are driving out, but ultimately, and, and you know that because of our, our concerns about the environment, that everybody not travelling to Rome is a is a good thing. Mm -hmm. so the less people that do have to travel, the downside is that we are a really social and, and I think that's what everybody misses the most, being able to be their friends that they've made by being at work. Sure. And Sarah? Just on the back of um, what Sarah has said as well, um, like we all love being on site, I love being on site, but the idea of remote from home actually makes it like a lot more accessible for a larger group of people, you know, people who've just had families and they want to be closer to home, or people with disabilities that find it quite challenging to be on an OB, like that is a really big positive of it, so we can branch out to larger and make it more accessible. Great, good answer. Yeah. And great, last but not least. Um, I think in, with PLP in particular, we've certainly started using a lot more um, contributors on Zoom, which, so you think about the pundits that you have in the studio, normally you'd have two or three pundits for a match, but because of COVID, begun to use Zoom and Skype a lot more, we've had a lot more contributors in, and I think that will definitely stay because it just brings another element into the shows. Um, so that's one positive to take of it. I also think kind of, I know we've mentioned engineers, but it's been such a massive team effort in terms of getting everything back up and running. Um, and, and it's a mix of staff and freelancers and fixed term and everything, and everyone's kind of gone above and beyond. Um, their role even kind of doing things outside of their role and I think hopefully that brings everybody together a little bit more as well and like people have said um, work-life balance I think is an important thing so I think hopefully that's something that stays with us um, as we kind of go back to some sort of normality because um, that, that that's definitely been another positive 
of this process. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Okay, we're going to go on to answer our Q and A with the um, with our audience. We've got a few questions in. Goodwin, I know you need to run away. Um, because you've got to make it to a, a match um, very, very yes, soon. So, <laughs> let's see, let's see. Questions, questions, questions. Um, I'll say bye for now. Okay, cool. Thank you very bye. much, good friend. Catch up with you later. Bye. Uh, um, Hazel, Hazel Palmer. Hazel Palmer said, as a camera operator, it's really reassuring to hear all of your sides of things and the obvious need for clearer communication and contact that can't always be remotely you're all doing an amazing job in very tricky circumstances so that's lovely um tony gregory says Great. interesting chat uh sarah c says that some matches including this weekend are still in location what are the criteria for deciding if a match should be remote or on site is that about um so is it just about capacity logistics who wants to take that one yeah i'm, I'm happy yeah. to say that yeah it, it, it is a lot about logistics to be honest um so thinking back, if we take Easter, for example, at Sky, we had 15 games over four days. Um, so, yeah, there's so much truck move, movement to get to those games, big days, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, we try and do it as much remote as possible for all the reasons we've discussed earlier, but sometimes it's, it's just impossible. Um, and we need to sort of remember as well, um, because at Sky we do Premier League, do the EFL, um, certain grounds we can uh, have remote capability but as you go lower down the leagues obviously their infrastructure is not as good so sometimes you're forced to do sort of the lower leagues like league one league two you have to do a traditional ob we haven't got the remote capability there mm. so yeah in a nutshell it, it is really logistics trucks availability what's going to work where geography yeah anybody else have anything to say on that one Cool. Okay. Tony also says Kylie's point about team eye contact is really important. I train directors and the non-verbal comms and hand signals is obviously a key thing. Have you used open Zoom calls with all muted so you can all see each other and use hand signals? Remote radio production, e.g. Radio 4, have made really good use of this. Any comments on that one? Um, on score, we do for um, some of the people that are uh, certainly the stats, stats guy, Toddy, He's always on a Zoom call, so he can see us, we can see him. Um, we can't always hear him because he's muted, but you know, he he's part of the team that way as well. And we our production meeting is always is via Zoom as well, so everybody sees everyone else. Hmm. Yeah. What about uh, for you, Gemma? We have um use we've we've tried it, certain sports at BT use it. I think MotoGP use it, um, and the rugby use it quite a lot. We we don't as yet. Um I'm not I'm not sure why I think because the pre match zoom calls were all always very painful um, if I'm honest, because uh, yeah it, it, it's zoom and teams calls are always for me quite difficult as to know when to speak or where everyone is so we've not really utilized it but I do think it's it you know it, it's potentially a good idea I think it's something that um, we could look to build in a bit more robustly in the future maybe. Hmm. I think one of the hardest issues is probably where you would put the screen. Um, yes, that, is, that is so full of everything, but yeah. uh, trying to see where everybody could see everybody else, it would be really tough, actually. The, 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 the point of that with the stack is really important as well, because the way our multi-viewers work now, um, you often, as a director, can't change all of your monitors because um, someone's sharing it with you. So one of your multi viewers is also graphics so you can't change everything on there because they don't want to see um the ar output or you know they, they don't want to see certain things so you're quite restricted and yeah as you say in your small desk space with your two glass screens on the side it's quite difficult to have um another monitor but yeah i think i think it sounds like a good idea yeah yeah if i need a real sound cool yeah. Last question for you, because I know Grace also has to run off to work as well. Um, <laughs> this is good. You guys have worked so hard, You're so busy. So Georgina, I'm oh, sorry, Georgia Rainbow, which is like an awesome name, um, says, with the difficulties we're all facing with communicating over Teams, Zoom, etc., um, do you find that as a woman, it is even more difficult to communicate because the difficulties women do face with communicating in a male-dominated area, being dismissed or even taken 
in a different tone, etc. Does that, has anyone experienced that or any comments on that one? The thing I would say, um, because of lockdown, it's kind of forced everybody to communicate uh, like outside of the gallery in terms of kind of office politics. It's forced everyone to communicate a bit better. So you find that you're kind of included on emails that might be conversations that would have otherwise happened in passing or in, in a group that you might have missed out on. It's kind of forced people to communicate a bit better. So I definitely feel like I've been included a lot more because of having to work from home and because of COVID and all the rest of it. So that's certainly one thing that I hope that carries on and kind of WhatsApp has been something that's been like we've relied on hugely during this whole process and still do. Um, and that's an, a, another example of kind of how we've had to kind of communicate with everyone. And it, it kind of, it feels a lot more inclusive now, I'd say, than perhaps beforehand. Brilliant. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much to all of my fantastic speakers we've run over our hour slightly but you are absolutely brilliant thank you so much um i hope you all got a lot from our conversation um if you have any further questions for any of our speakers please email me with them and i will forward them on for you um because i know some people don't want to sort of like put things in public and stuff but yeah just forward the questions over to me and i will send them over to your director of choice um this afternoon we have the SPG europe football summit 2021 so i hope to see some of you there as well i know sarah cheadle is going to be appearing on one of the panels which should be exciting <laughs> you can see her with a different haircut <laughs> <I'm not Spanish. laughs> get to stay in touch tell me your news and stories tell me if you want me to write something interesting about you um keep an eye out for our next mail about the next svg at women event and thank you all very much until next time see you soon bye, -bye.